Hello everyone. Welcome to Nesso Academy. In this lecture, we will understand destructors in C++. So without any further delay, let's get started with this lecture and let's see what are the topics. There is only one topic and the name of the topic is destructors. So let's get started with this topic and let's understand what is a destructor. A destructor is a special member function that is automatically called when an object goes out of scope or is explicitly deleted. First of all, destructor is a member function of a specific class. It belongs to a class, but it is a special member function that gets called automatically, just like a constructor. But it is different from a constructor in the sense that it gets called automatically when an object goes out of scope or when an object is explicitly deleted. We know this is not the case with constructors. A constructor is called when an object is created. It is also automatically called, but it is called when an object is created, not when it is destroyed. In case of destructors, they are called automatically when an object goes out of scope or when an object is explicitly deleted. As the name itself suggests, destructor is meant to destroy something. With the help of a destructor, we usually destroy the data members associated with the object when an object goes out of scope or when it is deleted. Now let's move to the second point. It does not have parameters and return type. Just like constructor, it does not have a return type. But unlike constructors, it does not have parameters either. So it does not have any parameters at all. We know in case of constructors, we can pass parameters. But that is something we cannot do in case of destructors. The third point is, a class can only have one destructor. We can only have one destructor per class. This is in contrast to constructors. We know we can define multiple constructors within a class, but there can be only one destructor possible in a class. I hope these points are clear to you up to this specific point. Now, here is the fourth point. It is called in reverse order of constructors. Destructors are always called in reverse order of constructors. This point will be clear to you when we discuss an example C++ program. After understanding the example, it will be clear to you how the destructors are called. So these are the points associated with destructors. Now, here is the syntax of how to define the destructor in C++. Destructor is defined just like a constructor, but we need to use the tilde symbol in front of the class name or we can say the name of the destructor. We need to use this symbol. This symbol differentiates it from a constructor. Also, we cannot provide parameters within parentheses. Within braces, we can provide the code for the destructor. Now, after understanding this syntax, we are ready to consider a C++ program that will help us understand how destructors work in C++ and how we can use them. Here is the example program. Here I have included the iostream header file and here I have defined the class array. This is the definition of the main function. Now through this class, I want to define a dynamic array, that too with the help of an object. For this purpose, I have defined these two data members of this class. These are private data members. Here we have the pointer data to an integer. This pointer will point to the dynamic array. And here we have the variable size to hold the size of the array. This variable has type integer. Now let's define the object of this class. This is the object ARR1 of class array and I have initialized it to 5. We know in order to initialize an object, 
we usually define a constructor. So let's define the constructor for this class. Here is the public constructor array. And to this public constructor, I have passed this parameter s. This parameter can receive the integer value that I have provided here. So s will receive value 5. Now we can provide this value to this variable size because this value is representing the size of the array that we want to define dynamically. So we can directly write this line size equals s. We can use the size variable here because this constructor is defined in the class. This is the public constructor and it can access the private members of this class. Here I have written size equals s. So the variable size will receive value 5. And this variable is associated to this object. So this is arr1.size. I hope this is clear to you. Now let's define our dynamic array. We already have the size in this class. We can define the dynamic array like this. Here I'm using the new operator to define the array. Here I'm defining the array of size number of integers. The variable size is provided as the size of this array. We know that for this object, variable size has value 5. So this will be replaced by 5. This means we will get 5 blocks where each block has the capability to store an integer inside heap. And those blocks are consecutive to each other. And from the new operator, we will receive the address of the first block inside this data pointer. So now data is the pointer to the array that has been allocated in heap. And the array has 5 blocks in total where each block can hold an integer. Now I hope this code is completely clear to you. After this, let's say I want to display the message to the user that the array has been created successfully. For this purpose, I have written this stdcout statement. This will display array of a specific size created on the screen. For this specific example and for this object, Array of size 5 created on the screen will be displayed. When we execute this program, this is the output we will get. Array of size 5 created. We are getting 5 in place of this variable size. And that is true. This shows that the array has been created successfully. And from this example, it is clear that whenever we create an object, the constructor associated to that object will be called automatically. We do not call the constructor. Now we also know this, that it is our responsibility to deallocate the memory that we have allocated in heap. For this purpose, we can define a destructor. The job of destructor is to destroy the members associated with the object. When an object goes out of scope, or when it is deleted explicitly. We know that after completion of this line, that is after execution of this line, zero will be returned to the operating system and the main function will complete its execution. Then this object goes out of scope. This is the meaning of going out of scope. Currently, the scope of this object is this main function. When the main function completes its execution, then the object goes out of scope. And when an object goes out of scope, then the memory associated with the object must be deallocated. I am talking about this specific memory block that we have allocated in heap. This memory must be deallocated because after completion of this main function, we do not need this array. So, the destructor is the best fit here because we know the destructor will be called when this function completes the execution. So here we should define the destructor of this class. This is how we can define the destructor. Here I'm using the tilde symbol to define the destructor. Here we do not provide any parameters. Within braces, we can write the code for the destructor. Here I have written this code. 
With the help of this line, the memory will be deallocated, which we have allocated dynamically with the help of new operator. This means the memory associated to the data pointer, which is indeed associated to the ARR1 object, will be deallocated. I hope this is clear to you. Here I am using delete operator for this purpose and I am providing the data as the pointer. After this, through STDC out, array of size 5 destroyed will be displayed on the screen. I am talking about this specific example. So when we execute this program, we know after this message, we will get this message, array of size 5 destroyed. This destructor will be called when this function completes execution. Here this line will execute and because of this line, the memory associated with this pointer data will be deallocated. This pointer is indeed associated to this object ARR1. So, the array of size 5 will be deallocated. So this is how the program works for this specific object. Now this is true for one object. What if we have multiple objects? Let's define one more object. Let's say we have this object ARR2 of this class and I am initializing this object with value 10. Now I would like to ask this question. What will be the order of constructors and destructors call in this specific case? Let's understand this properly. Here, I'm creating the object ARR1 of class array and I'm initializing it with 5. We know at this point, the constructor will be called. The new array will be allocated of size 5 in the heap and message array of size 5 created will be displayed on the screen. This is true. After this, it is not the case that the destructor will be called for this object. It is never the case that the destructor will be called when the constructor completes its execution. The destructor will be called when an object goes out of scope or when it is explicitly deleted. So the destructor associated to this object will be called when it goes out of scope or when it is deleted explicitly. After execution of this line, we need to execute this line. At this moment, this object is still in the scope of this main function. So the destructor associated to this object will not be called at this moment. At the time of execution of this line, constructor associated to the object ARR2 will be called automatically. And therefore, an array of size 10 will be allocated in the heap. ARR2.data will point to that array. And array of size 10 created will be displayed on the screen. I hope this is clear to you. So we will get the message array of size 5 created and then array of size 10 created. This means constructors for both these objects will be called first. And the order will remain same. First, the constructor of ARR1 will be called. Then the constructor of ARR2 will be called. Now, what about destructors? We know after execution of this line, 0 will be returned to the operating system. Then the main function completes its execution. This means we are done with the main function and we are done with these objects. As we are done with these objects, Memory that we have allocated in the heap for these two objects must be deallocated. For this purpose, the destructor must be called on these two objects. But the destructors will be called in the reverse order of constructors. This is what we learned in the last point, if you remember. The destructors must always be called in the reverse order of constructors. We know in this specific example, the constructors are called in the same order that we have here. 
first the constructor for ARR1 will be called, then the constructor for ARR2 will be called. Now the destructors for these two objects will be called in the reverse order. First the destructor of ARR2 will be called, then the destructor of ARR1 will be called. I hope this is clear to you. So what happens in this case? Because the destructor of ARR2 will be called first, the memory associated with ARR2.data will be deallocated. This means the array of size 10 will be deallocated. And therefore, we will see the message array of size 10 destroyed. After this, the destructor associated with ARR1 will be called. This means the memory associated with ARR1.data will be deallocated and this means the array of size 5 will be deallocated from heap and therefore we will see the message array of size 5 destroyed. So it is clear that when we execute this program, we will get this output on the screen. Array of size 5 created, array of size 10 created, array of size 10 destroyed, then array of size 5 destroyed. This output clearly shows the order of constructors and destructors calls. First, the constructors are called in the sequence ARR1, then ARR2. Then the destructors are called in the reverse order. That is, the destructor of the ARR2 is called first and then the destructor of the ARR1 is called. I hope this is entirely clear to you. So, with this, we have understood destructors properly. We now know what is the role of destructors in C++ programs. So, with this, we are done with this topic, destructors, and we are done with this lecture. Okay, friends, this is it for now. Thank you for watching this lecture. I will see you in the next one.